On this episode of Purposely Curious, I sit down with Matthew Chang to discuss financial literacy, a subject I once lacked the knowledge of. Have you ever wondered where your money is going? Want to learn some key points on how to keep more of your money? If so, join me as we embark on this fun episode where we discuss financial literacy and how we can all work toward a better understanding on managing our money. Get nice and cozy as this episode starts now. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining. Oh, it's my pleasure, Mary. Thank you for having me on here. Yes, I'm really excited to get to talk to you. Um, And for those of you guys listening, uh, this is Matthew, right? Yeah, you can call me Matt. It's perfectly fine. (laughs) Most people call me Matt. Matthew is just the legal proper name, if you know what I mean. (laughs) So he's an independent wealth manager with the World Financial Group and owner and CEO of Apex Concepts. Uh, Incorporated. Correct. Um, Has been in the financial services industry for 10 years, helping families understand and get ahead with their personal and business finances. And he is also a dedicated husband and father to a 15 month old baby boy. Yeah, he's all over the place. Yeah. It's like, it's amazing what kids do to your life. Like, my wife and I were just having this conversation, and I had this conversation with one of the other gentlemen in my office. When you become a parent, you literally will do anything for your kids, especially because like I think about like what I put my parents through growing up and I'm like, (laughs) damn, now I'm doing the same damn thing my parents (laughs) did. So it's really it's really impactful how being married and you start having children, how it really changes the dynamic of your family. Like my wife and I, we used to be able to just pretty much get up and go and do whatever we want. Now we're like, okay, we got we have a baby with us now. We have to still have to incorporate time to get him ready and then take him with us wherever we go. So it's, it's very life changing, but it's a total blessing. And, um, so since you are a finance guy, like how has that changed your budgeting? A lot. Uh, and something that I talk to a lot of people about is, you know, especially being in this industry, a lot of people, and we'll talk about this too, is people always talk about, they have trouble saving and, I knew in my early 20s, we were just talking about this before we started recording, um, I used to work for Costco Wholesale, and I used to be in retail management. So, you know, retail management, you don't make a lot of money. (laughs) So I had to learn to really budget and save money the right way. And so I'd always, even to this day, I'm still stickler about my money. And as funny as that sounds to a lot of people, that have been that stickler but also budgeting at the same time has come in handy a lot i mean i've had different financial you know challenges with like family and stuff like as an example um my last living grandmother passed away last year and i have other relatives that make just as much if not more money than me but they couldn't send money back home to the philippines to my mom Mm -hmm. to help with my grandmother's final wishes like to me that's like okay that's people not saving money and budgeting correctly you know something that I do every night even still to this day 10 years in is I still check all my bank accounts every night every night every night I check them every morning like a newspaper just uh, (laughs) log in right yeah and so something that I always remind some of my clients and even some of my friends and even some family members, if you have trouble budgeting, you should really look at your bank accounts every single day because that'll really teach you where you're spending money and where you're like, oh, man, I'm spending too much money on coffee. You know, people mm-hmm. go to Starbucks, they think, oh, I'm just going to buy one cup of coffee. That one cup of coffee is five dollars. You just don't buy one. Right. Sometimes pe- most people, they buy two. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at from a financial perspective, that's ten dollars a day. If you do that five days a week, that's fifty dollars. That's two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. And I agree with what you're saying, but I also feel that if you budget for it Mm -hmm. and that's something that's really important to you right? and you budget for it, like I think go ahead, get the latte, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. No, Um, I agree. But yes, it it does add up. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But going back to what you said is it it sounds like you were always good at budgeting. Is that correct? No, I was terrible, to be honest. Okay. Okay. I just had, I had to force myself to budget because I got to a point where... Because, you know, like a lot of, you know, I'm I'm first generation born and raised here. So we're taught, go to school, get a degree, do that whole deal. And that's what I was doing at that time. I was still going to school full time. I was working full time. And I'm like, okay, something's wrong because I, 
oh, why don't I have more money in my bank account as hard as I work? Mm -hmm. Where is it all going? And then I basically said, okay, I need to start getting my stuff together, my financial house in order. And that's when I was like, all right, I really got to start budgeting, making sure I'm not overpaying on stuff and make sure that I'm saving money first because someday I am going to stop working and I want to be in a position that I'm ready to stop working when I want to. So did you hear that somewhere or did you just think that on your own? No, I thought of it on my own, mm -hmm. but also too, after being in the industry, there's another saying too that we have, uh, retirement isn't an age. It's actually at what income, you know, and to kind of put another layer on top of that, um, because I know you and I, we are talking about this off air is something that I educate people on is making sure they know exactly how much money they have saved for retirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to live off of, say, three to four grand a month for 20 years in retirement, the magic number, if you do the math, is roughly about 1.2 million saved. Now. Now. If we look at it. If we look at it now, that's not in counting yeah. taxes, inflation, and all that other stuff. Um, but the magic number to live off of roughly about three to four grand a month for 20 years is roughly about 1.2 to 1.5. Yeah. So as an example, if you make 50 grand a year... 50 grand a year and you want to be retired for 20 years just take 50 grand times 20 that's 1 million dollars i mean that's pretty simple math and yeah. the question is how much money are you really saving to make that a reality so that's why i tell people retirement just isn't an age anymore in a sense it's really how much income do you really want to live off of when you do when you are ready to retire now here's the thing you could be retired at 50 and you don't even know that because you might get hurt at work or you might get sick where you can't go back to work. Mm -hmm. So that's why budgeting and making sure that you're paying yourself first and saving money, making that a priority is very, very important. At least from, you know, from my perspective, being, you know, in the industry and being a professional about it, it's just explaining to someone that they understand why it's important to save money just in general. Right. So I can tell you my experience with finances and, you know, when I've, my mom, the most that my mom ever told me was make sure to pay your bills on time. That was the extent of it. Um, so, but at my young age of 18, you know, I didn't understand what she meant. Right. I didn't really give it yeah. much thought. So I would get paid, which back then was, I don't know, I was probably working part time, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would go shop and then I would see whatever I had left. That's what I would be paying my bills with. So. Right. You know, until I was about 23, I was terrible, terrible with my money. Um, I As had, we all are. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was about, let's go out, where are we going? And then bills came last, which is what I'm assuming a lot of people do. Yeah, um, no, you're absolutely except right. Except some of us may grow out of it and others don't. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I... There's so much, there's so many levels to budgeting. And there that's is. one thing that I've noticed as I, have you know, I'm 36 years old now. What I've learned, you know, I consider myself very financially savvy than I was 10 years ago. Right. Um, and, but what, from all my reading, all my listening to podcasts and, right. you know, I realize that it's, uh, you know, it's a big problem in this country. It is. And it is a big uh, problem with minority yep. cultures, yep. you know? It is. Um, and so, um, like I said, my mom would tell me, pay, my mom was good with money. My mom would make less than my dad and she was good with money. She mm -hmm. always had money. Right. But she never taught me that end of it. It was yeah. just pay your bills on time. But I'm going to tell you the moment that I realized that I didn't know how to manage my money. It wasn't that I was broke. Right. Right. So I went to Starbucks with one of my friends and I, at the time, must have been like 23, 24, probably making double her salary. Right. We went to Starbucks and I didn't have enough money. And oh, like, God, like think of it. Yeah. I'm 23 years old. <laughs> a decline when you use um, a debit card. I was 23 years old and I was, she was like, oh, don't worry, I got you. You know, and I had one of those moments where I was like, how, how, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I'm making double what she's making. And it was kind of like a wake up call where I was like. I'm not managing my money. Right. I realized I wasn't managing it before, but I didn't see it as a problem until that moment in my life. Right. And I yeah. always tell her, like, if it wasn't for that day, I yeah. had like an out of body experience where yeah. I was like, no, I should be treating her like, you know, I, 
I wasn't I was not embarrassed. It was more like what the heck am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Yeah. yeah. And so at that point I started to look into my finances, mm -hmm. but I wasn't necessarily budgeting, but I took that step, you know. Right. Um but yes, that was kind of from there I just kind of every year that passed I was getting more and more educated, right. and, you know. And so that's why I like really like talking about finances. Mm -hmm. Um I had also read that the median, um, for those who don't know, um, my parents are Salvadorian and I was mm -hmm. born here in the U.S. And so statistically, I had read that like the median net worth for Hispanic women was like negative 100. Yeah. And or something like that. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be that statistic. Yeah. So then I started like, I'm going to track my net worth. And obviously you have school loans and yeah, I was in the liability. negative. Yeah negative for a long time and and what i'm getting at is that i'm no longer part of that statistic right i'm above it and i you know that was my goal so then here comes how do we change all that and yeah. it's it comes down to their at least i can speak for my culture from what i've seen um against not everyone is just mm -hmm. that there's lack of knowledge and that's of true education of making it simple you know, because I think, if, again, speaking just for the people that I know, it's, it scares them to hear big terms. And, you know, and yeah. so I wanted to speak to you because you also, you know, wrote, wrote a book where yeah. you it sounded like I was just talking to someone when I read your book. Yeah. And that's the reason why I wrote the book the way I did. I wanted to be more of if you're my friend or you're my family member, I'm just having a normal conversation with you um, and just talking about finance because. It, and now you talk about statistics. Let's kind of talk about that. Mm -hmm. The average median income for middle class in the United States as a whole, right, as of this year, is roughly 48672 Okay, it's a really odd number. Most people say, oh, it's just 50 grand. Let's just say 50 grand, mm -hmm. right? That's for a majority of middle class here in America. Now, obviously, big parts of that, we're in California. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're paid more obviously than other states even though i i forget what the minimum wage is in california now. i think it's 11 I it might be i think it's 11 now i mean we're in i mean they base it by counties mm -hmm. and i think la is going to be the top one at 15 dollars an yeah. hour in the next i think two years based on how mm -hmm. they redid some of the laws and the labor laws but you look at it statistically speaking uh average family uh makes about 48 grand and but now you look at how much people actually have in the bank since we're talking in that direction average couples over 35 uh have roughly about 8800 in the bank now no so i'm just talking about just in the bank not investments or anything else couples under 35 with children have less than 4800 couples under 35 without children have less than 2800 so we know what you're just speaking of it's like okay where am I really spending my money? Mm -hmm. Why am I not tracking a lot of this? And you look at how much the average American has sa even saved for retirement between 30 and even 60. The average American has less than a hundred grand saved. And that for me, from my perspective, that's very scary. I mean, having less than a hundred grand saved for retirement, what if you had to retire tomorrow? And if you have to live off of 50 grand a year, that's going to last you all of two years mm -hmm. and so that's why for you know talk about financial literacy that's why it's so important people have to understand how money works why it works uh but also too you look at how our system works just in general in the united states only two states require a quarter or semester of financial education but 48 states require sex ed Mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting. I'm like, but what's the point? Because money is going to play a big factor if you become a parent. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you start having a lot more responsibilities, understanding money plays a really, really big role in your life. And it's huge. Like, uh, And even right now, two of the biggest concerns that keep coming up to me when I talk to people about personal finance is how do I save more money, right? How the heck do I stop living paycheck to paycheck? But mm -hmm. also, too, it's credit. I mean, you need credit for everything, too. And those are two things you're going to use your entire life. Let's face it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny that you say that because the way I learned. Um, so I realized that 
I got a, I went to a private school, um, private technical school, I guess you can call it. And I got a, a loan for up to about sixty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, which I was like, my thought process, right, was like, okay, I'm gonna sign the loan amount, and I thought of it as an expensive car, and I went, but I wasn't looking in as a young person, right? Interest, yeah. how long they expected me to pay it? Because right. at the time, I think I, I believe it was Sally May at the time. Yeah, which is one of the bigger ones. Yeah, so Sally May. You know, even with me having good credit, kind of, I think it, they gave me a uh, interest of like thirteen percent, even with wow, even with um, decent credit. <laughs> yes, but what I'm getting at is that that didn't mean shit to me when I signed. Yeah. I was just like, okay, where where do I sign? Because I didn't have the someone knowledge, there. Yeah. I didn't have the knowledge, and there was nobody there to talk right. me out of it. Right? Right. right. So I'm like, okay, I need a degree because this is what we go to school. We're supposed right. to go to college. So right. I signed. And then um, when I had that moment where I said, where is my money going? I tried to figure out how do I budget? You know, where is my money going? Like, mm-hmm. so I would spend less. Long story short, I then moved out. And so I was like, I'm going to sit down and I'm a visual learner. So right. I was like, I get paid on this day. I get right. paid on this day. What bills are in between. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I did. Yep. And at the time I was like, you know, I'm going to save $300 a month. But before that, I had never saved mm-hmm. and a it's penny. A, it, yeah. And it's a tough, and it's, if you haven't been saving already, it's a very tough habit to start. Yes. And so I'm kind of running you through my life financially, right? right? So I started 300 and then I would taper back or, and then go back up. Yep. Then when I really started to get serious, so they wanted me to pay six hundred dollars a month for like 25 yep that sounds about right 25 years um and not once did i think interest yep how much will i end up paying so for the first few years i literally was playing the minimum yeah when i realized what am i doing Mm -hmm. you know yeah you're not attacking the actual principle exactly so i went and you know basically living with my mom i started sending 1600 every month yeah you know, and I still hadn't heard of any of these financial concepts. Concepts. Yeah. So I was just, I just need to get out of it. Yep. So I paid it off by the time I was, this was like the big loan because they gave you. Yeah, it's usually two separate loans. Yes. The big loan to cover a majority of the expenses and then a smaller so that one, one for the smaller stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. so, as, so I paid it off by age of 30. And so I, I could have paid easily a hundred thousand i think Mm -hmm. um but what i'm getting at is that then that freed up all that money yeah but then i fell back to not knowing what to do my old habits and so long story short i've come a long way i've then found you know podcasts yep and they started educating me and i was like okay let's do the i did the snowball effect snowball effect yep that's something i teach my clients yes so i did the snowball effect and then i started seeing the benefits of it and so um at this point i should be completely debt free in two tops three months that's awesome so i'm really excited and having done all this remember i told you i was just saving like 300 dollars and then 200 more well i'm already saving up to 31 percent of my salary that's awesome so i'm excited in two three months it's gonna be i'm shooting for half my salary (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and see to talk about that yeah. is, and we were talking about this off air, is most people they'll make that fifty grand, and their expenses are all the way up to that threshold, and that's part of the reason why people live that paycheck to paycheck life because mm-hmm. they're like, oh, I'm making X amount of money, you know, I can spend X amount versus doing what you're doing, you know, or doing it, that's stuff that I teach my clients and stuff that I've been doing for years is. You know, you want to be saving a good portion of your income. You right. should be living very, very, you know, below, below your, your means. means. It's kind of like Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's a perfect example. Mm-hmm. He talks about saving invest money all the time. I mean, if you look at what he, even what he's driving right now, he drives a seven-year-old Cadillac. Mm-hmm. And by the way, his daughter that helps run his company tells him when to buy a car, <laughs> which is a funnier thing. And most people are like, Warren Buffett still drives a used car. Yeah, I do the same thing. I mean, granted, yeah, I mean, I drive a Mercedes, but I haven't had a car payment in seven years. Oh, wow. So, I mean, you really think about it. Most people are like, 
okay, this guy owns Mercedes. He's probably paying like six, seven hundred dollars a month. Yeah, but that's a depreciating asset. That's what some people don't look at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're paying six to seven hundred dollars a month on depreciating asset on top of interest. What's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, I'm like, no, I'll just pay the car in cash. I can write off the depreciation and just be done with it Mm -hmm. and not ever have to worry about it. Yeah. So, you know how I was telling you my process Mm -hmm. of how I got to where I'm at. And so I think what I want people to understand is that this wasn't overnight. No, it like, takes, yeah, it's a process. It, it takes must, some time. I must time. have been like 23 when I slowly, slowly started to be like, oh, you know, why am I always broke before, you know, before pay, pay day. payday? Payday. Yep. <laughs> That's a lot of people. So it's yeah. literally retraining your brain and it takes time and you're going to, you're going to fall, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to overspend and that's okay. That happens. You know, the, the moment you start looking at your finances and actually taking serious when you're spending, you're better off than you yeah. were yesterday. And that's yep. the, what I kept reminding myself because I have a thing where I make myself guilt, feel guilty. Right. And yeah. I'm like, Oh my God, like I overspent and blah, 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 blah. but I keep reminding I myself, yep. yeah, like what, you know what? 23 year old me would be very proud and think yep. you're really doing well for yourself. Yep. Like, <laughs> yep. So I, you know, when I talk to friends who ask me advice, I tell them it's, don't it's not overnight like and and that's one of the since you're a financial in the financial sector i wanted to tell you that one of the things that annoys me is that sometimes i'm not referring to you or anything it just uh i have met people who are condescending yeah and i don't feel that that's the attitude to have towards finances right if we want to teach and make people literate right come down to their level yep right Meet them at where they're at. Right. Right. So they might just need basic budgeting. Like, yep. let's not overwhelm them with, you know, all this other all stuff. this other stuff yep. for retirement. Like, and and so I think that's where people might get turned off. You know, like some people will grab it and be like, yep. yeah, I this is what I got to do. But that population that's like, okay, you're scaring me. You're telling me a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. and I can only focus on one, one thing. thing. Yeah. Because then that time. discourages them, and right. that that's where there's certain things the certain uh, approaches mm-hmm. that the financial sector has that I it bothers me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and see that really comes down to the person you're actually meeting with. Mm-hmm. Like I've met with other people from other companies and each, each kind of, each kind of company has their own type of philosophy, mm-hmm. which is great because then at least they have something to work, work with. Um, but the way I was taught and the way that I was trained is Start just like what you're talking about. Start with the basics. Mm -hmm. So something that I like to do is let's just take a snapshot of where you're at currently. Right. So let's just write down. Okay. Where are you at as far as what do you have for debt? Is it in control? Is it out of control? Where are you at with just general savings? Where you are with retirement? You know, if you have Mm -hmm. children, have you started a college fund? And do you have an emergency fund? Like I look at the basics first, just like what you're talking about, Mm -hmm. because you have to keep it for most, for most people, you have to keep it very, very simple. Right. And that's what I was trained on how to do it is, all right, this is where you're at now. Can you explain? Because I I have to know, at least from my perspective is I have to kind of see what you understand about finance Mm -hmm. in order for us to maximize the time and make sure that I'm doing my justice to make sure that you're educated and that you make the right decision. It's not what I say. It's the decision you make based on the knowledge that you're given. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's very, very important that even sometimes when I sit down with a couple, I mean, I anticipate one hour that I'm going to be with them, but sometimes questions happen, Mm -hmm. you know, or they say, Hey, I actually have this. What should I do with this? They have other, you know, they have other investment accounts are like, okay, well, I don't know how this works. And can you explain to me how it works and what else I can do to maximize or, you know, this day and age, how do I protect my money? Because a lot of people they're worried about the market right now. Right. And that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's, it can go many different ways for me, you know, from my perspective, I like keeping it very, very simple. And then building upon that as the foundation and then seeing, okay, this is where you're at. What areas do you want to improve on first and why? And then we can go from there. Yeah. And I think that is an amazing approach because that way they won't feel intimidated 
you know, where people may feel like, okay, you're trying to sell me things. Right. You, I'm overwhelmed. Like, I'm just trying to figure out how to budget, you know? Right, like, <laughs> right. And, and, you know, and I even developed my own, I have my own spreadsheet that I use that I've developed over the years. Uh, and it's some, it, it's almost a mirror of what my firm uses, mm -hmm. but it's in a format where I can literally punch in the numbers and it can basically tell me, okay, this is where you're at. This is an idea of how much money you should be saving. This is an idea of how much life insurance coverage you should get based on your assets. If you own a home, you mm -hmm. have children, stuff like that. So I kind of developed my own thing. Uh, and because that's just the nerd in me. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's just how I am. But it sounds like you can break it down. Yeah. And I can break it important. down. Very, yeah. I can break it down very, very simply so that somebody says, okay, look, this is, I, and I basically just turn my screen around and say, okay, this is where you're at based on where you're at. These are suggested paths on how much money you should save. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, it's just a template. And this is something I always explain to all my clients. What I'm showing you is just a template. If I need to change certain numbers around where, you know, like if I told you, if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you can't save, you know, based on what I'm explaining, you can't save $300. Okay. What can you really ideally save comfortably? Start somewhere. Right. Yeah. It's better to start somewhere because the thing I, I explain to a couple or whoever I'm sitting down with is if it's not comfortable to do, it doesn't serve you long term. Mm -hmm. That's my main point. Because if it doesn't serve you long term, then there's no point in having this conversation. Mm -hmm. it, there really isn't. Mm -hmm. But if it is comfortable, then let's start somewhere as your foundation. And every year, we'll revisit your finances. And if you're in a better financial situation, then let's revisit and look at, okay, how much more money can we save? Because the thing that you've heard the old um, saying as you make more money, you should be saving more money. And obviously you're, you're already proof of that yeah. going from saving $300 a month to now saving almost 30% of your monthly income, 31%. which is good. Yeah, so there you go. Right. <laughs> so, and that's a philosophy that even I still follow today is yeah. as I've made more money, I still keep my same lifestyle. I don't go out like I still, and this is no knock on a lot of my friends, but I kind of tell them, Hey, you know, you're at an age where you got to be really, really serious. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I, we're the same age, mm -hmm. you know, we're both 36. So we know, okay, we've done the party and we've done all that. Now it's like, okay, we got to be really, really serious about life and which direction we're really going to go. Right. Right. And, you know, again, everyone gets to that place at some point, right? right. Um, some of us younger, like right. yourself, some of us later. Well, yeah. And, and I then have a lot of clients like that. I also know people that aren't there yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they'll ever be there, you know? Yep. And, um, and it's a mentality. That's, yes, that's part of it. Yes. And I think so. So the reason I wanted to have you is because I, you know, after reading your book, you broke it down. And I, I love, I've read a few financial books where they break it down to where the person who's just looking to be better than yesterday. Right. You know? Um, and so to me, you, there was a quote that you said, how people view and understand money ultimately determines their financial future. It's totally true. Um, I growing up, remember hearing people say, you know, rich people, you know, bad people or, you know, money that da, 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 da. like it, that negative thoughts yeah, without you realizing that you're almost blaming others. Now I'm not saying that there aren't, reasons why that you know there are bad or good i'm right. just saying the moment i stop blaming someone else for my financial woes yeah is when i started to kind of see the change and be like okay i'm better off than i was five years ago right i'm better off than i was 10 years ago and right. so i kind of started feeding off of that but no one was stopping me mm -hmm. but myself right but it was my lack of knowledge right my lack of knowledge and my lack of you know support in the sense of to have someone there to break it down to me mm -hmm. at my level. Cause my level was down here at the bottom at yeah. the time. Right. Yeah. Podcast came and kind of saved my life. Yeah. Cause I'm and like it's a driving for a lot of people and yeah. people were breaking it down their experiences. You know, someone lost a job after, you know, not a job, but they were in disability. They didn't, they were like, wow, I don't have any money. And, you know, just to see how they got out of those holes, I took pieces from each yeah. person and so I, I, from your book, you kind of touch into the mentality of yeah. money and how that plays a role. Yeah. In and it, and it's a huge role because people are, 
have a misconception about money. They think money is bad. That that that's what we're taught growing up. Having a lot of money is bad. And I beg to differ in a, in a, in a, in a serious way because if you don't understand how money works, how do you ever expect to accumulate a lot of it? Exactly. That's that's my main point. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Um, but the mentality of understanding money and I, I was ready I you know I was preparing for this is part of that is most people they don't just take the time to learn that's the that's the biggest challenge for most people Mm -hmm. because they're just like no i just want to you know do the whole go to school get a degree start working and really not think about it until my 40s or 50s which by the way i have clients like that Mm -hmm. they're in their 40s with literally nothing and to me that's really really scary Mm mm-hmm especially being you know from an immigrant family first generation born and raised here i watched my parents work really really hard thank god that they did save enough money that they live very comfortably in retirement like i'm blessed that my parents can watch my son mm-hmm. that's a that's a big deal for me right because they are also here, saving money yeah i mean daycare <laughs> like daycare where i live in the inland empire it it starts at like twelve hundred dollars a month. Oh wow, really? That's four hundred dollars. No, yeah, three hundred dollars a week. Yeah. To watch a fifteen month old for four hours. Wow, I had no idea. That's how really expensive it is. So I'm very blessed that my parents set an example to kind of build upon that. They set an example to work hard and save money. But being in this industry, I started understanding a lot more what, what we we're just talking about. It's a mentality. Because the mentality you have to have is, okay, I'm working so hard for my money. How do I keep more of it? That's the, that's, that's the ideal. And then when you start really educating yourself, like I've done for myself, especially being in the industry for, you know, almost, it'll be 10 years in April. Um, just under having a basic understanding of money is a good start. And then asking the advice of other people that Mm -hmm. have a much higher net worth now and what i mean by advice is qualified advice not your neighbor that's a plumber (laughs) you know or you know your uncle that's a postal worker that you know has been investing in stocks take advice from somebody that actually has practical knowledge and they actually do care and in my case i carry a license to have these financial conversations and actually in by law, I'm what they consider a fiduciary. I have to do what's best for my client. So it's my fiduciary duty to talk to people about financial literacy. Mm-hmm. And But most people, they don't want to have that conversation because they're like, well, I don't want to plan for something 20, 30 years down the road. I'm more worried about now. And that's a mentality, right? And I've read numerous books. Um, you know, some of my favorite books that I've read are, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the gentleman, Anthony Robbins or Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called Money Mastering the Game, where he interviewed 50 of the wealthiest people in America. And they all have a very, very same theme about learning about money and having a diverse portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the biggest point of that book. And he had a continuation uh, in a second book called Unshakable, where he takes all the different ideas and investment portfolios and he puts it into what he calls an all weather portfolio. So it's just understanding that your 401k or your IRA isn't the only thing out there to plan with. Right. There are different investments out don't there. Don't put all your yeah, eggs don't put in all one your basket. eggs in one basket, exactly. And that's the one thing that most people do having a 401k or an IRA is they put all their eggs in one basket and hope that it all works yeah. out. And now we look at it from a history perspective. You and I, we've been alive long enough that we've seen three stock market crashes. Yeah. And the average stock market crash is between 30 and 40%. And when I I had just started my I guess career uh, when 2008 happened, happened. Um, it did not affect me per se because mm-hmm. I was able to get a job, but I was old enough to, to understand, s- to understand. I am a, my dad growing up always taught me or showed me and my brother how to watch documentaries. And so we're very nerdy in that sense. And I was watching frontline on PBS mm-hmm. and it was probably a year after the crash mm-hmm. and people were like, I was literally about to retire 
I had what I thought was a million dollars in my 401k. Mm -hmm. And literally and, lost half overnight. Yes. So yep. they were like, I couldn't retire. But they, all their money was there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here still, again, 23, 24, hearing this. And I'm absorbing it. And I'm like, you, okay, so don't put all your money in there. You know, right. like, but I didn't understand. What they meant by what it. What they meant by it. I understand it now. And that, so that's uh, very important. It's not to rely on one form of it. Yeah. Of, of one it. plan. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then, and the whole idea is because what people have to understand is not all savings accounts and investments all perform at the same time. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a teeter totter between different types of investments that you want to have in your, in your financial portfolio that do perform differently. Yeah. That's why from our perspective, that's why we recommend having different investments, you know, which makes total sense. Yeah. Because, and most people, you know, most people, they, they think, no, I'll just put everything in just my 401k. And I'm like, and you can totally do that, but you, you run a lot of risk. I mean, you know, you run a, what, what I like to call you're, you're not, you're not avoiding the tax risk and the market risk by putting everything in one bag in one basket mm -hmm. you know yeah. because you only have one thing it's like you drive the same it's kind of saying you got a car when you first graduated college and you basically drive that car all the way until the day you die mm -hmm. like things are going to happen that you're going to have to fix right, right. and you, you're going to have to learn the hard way unfortunately yeah. so that's why from a different perspective it's having money in multiple places actually works to your advantage yeah and in your book, you said that 401ks initially weren't meant to be a retirement plan. No, they weren't. So let's kind of, let's have a quick history lesson about yeah. that. So you notice this day and age, pensions don't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the idea behind a pension, because, well, let's kind of back up a little bit more. Retirement used to be a three-legged stool. Let's start there. It used to be a pension, social security, and personal savings. That's what they call the three-legged stool of retirement. Okay. That's really two-legged now, and it really doesn't work because pensions don't exist. Because pensions used to pay 80 to 90, sometimes 100% of someone's salary when they retired. But that was back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s when people were only living 10 years into retirement. They're like, gone. That's, that, that was the st statistic companies started getting smart because it was too expensive to have those pensions pay. I mean, imagine you work for a company for 30 years, you don't work there anymore and they're paying hundred percent of your salary. They're like this financially for a company doesn't make any sense because this person is not making this money. Right. So what happened in the seventies and eighties is all these top end executives to companies were trying to figure out, okay, we're making these millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but we need a tax break because we're making all this money. And so they lobbied Congress and the Senate to develop these qualified plans, 401ks, IRAs, thrift savings plans, uh, 457 plans, like all these different type of retirement plans, not only from a perspective of for the tax write-offs for these executives, but also to the history lesson that goes along with it was to pump more money into the market. Mm -hmm. A lot of people actually don't know this part of why qualified plans exist, but it was for big name companies and for the government to pump money back into the market so that they can charge more, not just from investment companies and stuff like that, but all the fees and stuff, but just have more money in the market just in general. That was part of it. Mm -hmm. And so my point being with that is, and over time, that's what companies use to say, hey, one of the benefits we're working with us is you're going to get a 401k. And by the way, we'll match it mm -hmm. up to a certain percentage, which a lot of people like, hey, and for me, from my perspective, I don't argue with free money. Right. I never do. Yeah. And I never will. Yeah. But it's free money that people will get matched. And that's eventually what turned into the retirement plans for everyday Americans because pensions don't exist yeah and to kind of talk about what goes along with retirement is social security um you know i don't know if you've seen your social security statement recently uh my most recent one said that social security is going to be gone by 2032 because it's just a big trust fund that's all it is but guess who keeps taking out of the trust fund 
the government. Yeah. They keep writing a bunch of IOUs that they can't pay back. Right. And that's the reason why Social Security is going to be gone in the next, what, 12 years now that they're talking about. And even if they can pay benefits, it's only going to be 75 cents for every dollar if they can even afford it. Right. So that's why right now... When you shouldn't I talk to people, rely. Yeah, you shouldn't rely yeah. on government assistance because guess what? Government assistance. I mean, and it's not to discount anybody that's using it because it does. It does have its. It does serve its purpose. It's not gone yet. So yeah, it's, it's not gone yet. So people yeah. will still take advantage of, of it. Of course. Um, but at the same time, if you're going to rely on the government's plan, guess what? Their plan for you isn't the greatest. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. that's the biggest part of that. I listened to uh, Chris Hogan. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, someone had called in, same kind of question, you know, and he was said, he literally said exactly what you said, which was, do not rely on the government. Yep. You know, try to save as much as you can. Yep. Um, but going back to the 401ks, um, I can talk about, you know, I guess my employer, they don't match. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not too keen on the 401k there. Right. Do you see what I mean? And But I'm noticing a pattern where they may have been giving you 10% then it's like seven, five. Yep. What I hear a lot of people say is five, three now, right? Yeah, it's like and three. then there's a lot of companies now that for the for their tax advantage provide a 401k, but they don't match now. And so yeah. I feel like now that's the trend that we're yeah. falling into. So is it still important at that point? Let's say the company doesn't offer you a match. Are you better off doing something else? It, that comes down to someone's mentality about money. Mm-hmm. I mean, me, from a professional standpoint, if you're not saving money just in general, you have to start somewhere. Right. Even if your company is not matching you, it's better to at least start a habit. Even if it's only like 2 to 3%. I mean, yeah, it might only be, say, 50 bucks a, a pay something. period. It's still something. Yeah. But the other part of that, too, is if you know you're not getting matched, that's when you should really start taking it upon yourself. Take that first step of like, all right, what other options are there mm-hmm. to plan for my future? Because obviously my company doesn't care enough about me. And and this is just <laughs> how I think. My company basically doesn't care enough about me <laughs> that they don't want to match my contribution. I get it. I, I, I really get it. So it's like, okay, so what am I going to do for myself? And that's where a lot of people have that roadblock. It's like, all right, I'm not qualified enough to you know, do it on my own. But then there's also the negative connotation. I don't have 50 grand, 100 grand, 250 grand to sit down with a guy at Charles Schwab or Merrill Lynch and pay that guy three grand an hour, just Mm -hmm. give me advice. And sometimes to come find out, they won't even take me as a client, but they, I still got to pay the guy three grand. Yeah. You know I mean, there's I mean? a lot of avenues now yep. with technology. Oh yeah. You talk about like Robin hood mm-hmm. stash, um, you know, a few of the things that I use that's tied to world financial group betterment. Uh, that's a great way to, you know, they can, they ask a few questions based on your profile. They say, okay, this is what we recommend, which is good. And you can always change it. Mm-hmm. And that's the advantage of technology now. But that still won't beat the traditional advice sitting down with an advisor because right, right. Everybody's everybody's financial situation is a little different. Yeah. And you know there are companies out there that just try and put everybody in the same size six shoe, and that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, like I have friends that we'll talk about. Like Chris Hogan's a big Dave Ramsey guy. You know, uh, uh, a Dave Ramsey follower. Which his advice, it from my perspective worked really really well in the 80s and 90s when markets were booming Mm -hmm. but the market is so volatile now you have to start really looking at alternate investments that kind of help mitigate against the tax risk and the market risk like what i was mentioning earlier yeah you know what i mean so and that's why i said it it still comes down to a mentality of okay what am i gonna do to better myself and i know you're a very avid reader so that makes a lot of sense of why okay podcasts i've been listening to podcasts and so they are saying this, okay, let me see if that can work with, that would suit me and my lifestyle and how I can save and invest for the future. Right, right. And so um, I think too, I, I do feel that um, learning, I guess, the different type of things you can invest in mm-hmm. is, you know, also something that kind of blocks people because there's mm-hmm. so many types of accounts and right. it, you know tax deferred not tax deferred like you mm-hmm. know and I, I do know that that kind of scares people off 
Um, but it's, I see that it's very important, um, just because in the line of work that I have, you know, healthcare is very expensive Yes. after retirement. And I think maybe all of us have this mentality that we are going to die of old age with no issues, but you know, our kidneys might fail. So we need dialysis. Yep. Dialysis centers charge, I I hear about like 20,000, 15,000 per session. Yep. Medicare pays pays a certain. Yep. And some part comes uh, out. And then some of it is you out of pocket. You know, we don't know that our kidneys are going to fail. Right. Or you might live to 102 and you really outlived your money. Yep. And so these are things that I don't think uh, like even myself, I don't feel like I'm prepared. Yep. And I'm sure a lot of people don't feel like they're prepared. And it it is kind of scary. But what I have noticed is that those that had something to bring forth financially, Mm -hmm. they all invested. Yep. And And one thing that I kept hearing over and over, mutual funds, mutual funds, mutual funds. Yeah. But there's different types of stuff. There are different types, yeah. But just to show you that that's when I started to say like, okay, I'm seeing a pattern. The ones who have the money, you know, it's not tied to their house. Right. Because another thing that I saw is that people wanted, didn't have money for their health stuff, right? Right. They had the house, but they wanted to leave the house for the kids. So they couldn't use money. Essentially, they were broke. Yep. Right. And then these people had like all this money from mutual funds that they, they were that saving they for. Liquidate. Yep. Yeah, but they have the finances. And so I started to see like, okay, I want to do what they're doing because they're having the least amount of problems as far as financially right so i started to see like okay let's not be afraid of it as much yeah and see that comes down to mentality again too because if you have a lot of money saved you're less stressed out if you're less stressed out you actually live a lot longer that's already a proven statistic yeah if you have a lot of money saved you don't worry about money you know because having that money is that is that is that cushion yeah right but now to talk about what you just mentioned the two biggest fears that most people have is one outliving their money mm-hmm. and two liquidating their retirement assets to pay for health care. Now that's this, what it's there for. Yeah. And I think that's the mentality. Yeah. That... And what a lot of people actually don't realize is when you stop working for a company, you lose those health benefits. So you're kind of forced to rely on Medicare and Medi-Cal and all these different programs. What a lot of people don't understand is what goes along with those programs. And you being a nurse, you'd understand this because sometimes you're in acute, acute skill or acute care where it's specialized care for that certain kind of condition. There was a publication of a statistic of how much even a healthy couple will spend in retirement from 65 to 85 is 400,000 in healthcare alone. Wow. And like when I talk about that, people are like, wait, are you kidding me? We're really going to spend about 400 grand. So if you saved a million dollars, theoretically, you're losing 400 grand right off the bat for just for healthcare. So you have to figure out how to live off of 600,000 for 20 years. I mean, you start doing the math, that's like 30 grand a year. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. And so from a financial planning perspective, what you're talking about, how people have mutual funds, that's one way. But in our industry, things have changed so much that there's a ton of options when it comes to not only just planning for retirement, but also planning for those health care costs in mm-hmm. the future. And one thing that I also make sure that I explain to a lot of my clients, because I do work with an estate planning attorney, um, and I, it's funny, I actually need to call him. That's a good reminder. Mm-hmm. When you're on... Medi-Cal or Medicare, specifically Medicare, um, you get to a point where you need skilled nursing for care. You, there's a threshold of how much your net worth or how much in assets you can actually have. I don't, I don't know if you've done this much research on mm-hmm. this, but in order for you to get government assistance through Medicare, when it comes to, say, you know, living in a facility or anything, you have to show less than $2,000 in assets. So that means you can't even have a house. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, uh, just a disclaimer, I'm not a, you know, I'm not an estate planning attorney or tax attorney, but you have to understand they consider your house as an asset. Right. So the government basically says you're going to have to sell the house before anything, before we can even think about helping you, which is really, really sad. Yeah. And I think that's something that people don't think of. 
and I you do mention the different types of things you can invest in mm-hmm. in your book. Um, yeah, there's you, a lot. Yes, and you you broke it down in terms that you know, I felt like okay, you know, this makes sense. This yeah. this makes total sense. So I do feel that we would love to share your book so yeah. that it, you said it's. Uh, actually, it's funny you mentioned. I actually just uploaded it. Um, onto my social media uh so if if you're on instagram you can follow me at at m chang m c h a n g one two four that's my personal one which by the way it's public (laughs) (laughs) because i you know i do get a lot of questions like hey you you share a lot of great value it's like you know you should make it public so i did um there's also my business page at apex concepts inc um it you'll actually see a link to my link tree and if you go on my link tree you'll see a free ebook about personal finance that's my book um it's live on there you can download it uh and the whole point of why i wrote that book just like what 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 the purpose of why i wrote that book is just to help people yeah you know because people don't have that understanding about money that's why i wrote it in a manner of hey i want to help and it's encouraging people to seek out the help yeah that's my main point is Mm -hmm. seek out the help to get ahead with your finances because if you don't do it now when are you really going to do it yeah and one step at a time yeah it's one it's one little step at a time and that's what people have to understand is changing your whole financial future like what you're talking about doesn't happen overnight it really takes a step by step i mean when i first got into the industry i was living paycheck to paycheck. I had $10,000 in credit card debt. And that's part of the reason why I got into the industry is because one, it could help me, but also two, I just, I honestly just wanted to make extra money, get out of credit card debt. And then after I got a credit card debt in less than, uh, what was it? Six months because I was helping other people with their finances. I'm like, all right, this makes a ton of sense. And after about two years, of doing financial planning wealth management part-time while still working my full-time job i was so busy helping people with their finances i had to put in my two weeks at costco wholesale and most people they get scared of making that jump because they think about oh my security and all that other stuff trust me the way that how we're taught is one thing but when you actually educate yourself, you know, it's why people do podcasts and write ebooks and, mm-hmm. you know, vlogs and stuff like that. Once you're actually educated, the jump's not hard to make. Yeah. It's just getting started. Yeah. 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 And I know that was the case for me and for a lot of people. And I, I really recommend you guys reading his book. Um, I literally felt like he was talking to me just like a friend and broke down everything. Like I said, I had no idea that 401ks weren't essentially a retirement plan yeah, and, initially and to so. kind of yeah and to add to that there's actually a time magazine article that actually explains the whole thing yeah I'll, I'll i'll get you the info so that people can actually look it up if i remember right it was october of 2011 that they published that article about how the 401k yeah. works and why it wasn't truly a retirement plan at first it was just more as a tax break for all these highly paid executives now, if for those who just want to start getting their financial shit together, <laughs> are there books that you recommend? Yes. Um, a few of the books I recommend, uh, one of them is actually one of the first ones I read is by T. Harv Eckerd called Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. And it's just the mentality of, you know, of a millionaire. Because, I mean, we all talk about being millionaires and most people, they don't have access to a millionaire. You know, your life is all about your associations. Most people, we don't have access to a millionaire. So they're like, well, I can't be a millionaire if I don't know what the heck they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's one book I highly recommend. Um, There's another book called The Millionaire Next Door. I've read that. That's a great book. Uh, But one of my absolute favorites is The Richest Man in Babylon. Yes. So that book was written hundreds, hundreds of years ago. And if you put it... So I found out about it and it's just literally... Everything that we talked about is living below your book. means, yep. right? Um, saving, paying yourself first. Yep. Minimum I mean, 10%. That's yes, what he talks about. Yes, it's amazing. And that's literally what a lot of the financial pl- people teach you now. And it's yep. the exact same thing. So I, when I found out how old it was, I was yep. like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy to think about it. Yeah. And so those are some of those books. 
Um, obviously, a couple of the books that I recommended earlier from uh, Tony Robbins, Money Mastering the Game and Unshakable. Those are great books to start with. Um, and obviously, there are a lot of other personal finance books out there. But I think just having some of those is a great way to start. I mean, I it, maybe one of these I'll, I'll post on my Instagram, my entire library in my house. Uh, I have over 250 books in my house, at yeah. least in, in my home office. Um, I do some of my best work at night, like most most people. You know, after my wife and my son go to bed, uh, that's when a lot of my other work still starts. It doesn't end just mm-hmm. because I'm already home. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe I'll post on my Instagram and I'll make sure I tag you in it. Yeah. Uh, showing all the personal finance books that I have on yeah. my shelf. And actually, I have books that don't even fit on my shelf right now. They're actually sitting on the, <laughs> they're sitting on the floor of my home office because I just don't have space. So I'm yeah. so you can in use the pro- them as a coffee table. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually using, um, I'm in the process of kind of rearranging my home office so I can fit more books. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just one thing to self-education. Uh, One big tip that I tell a lot of people, they say, hey, so what do I, what can I do to not just better my finances, but better myself? 10 pages a day out of a book. Yeah. Just start small. Even if it's reading, start small. Give give yourself uh, one chapter a day, right? Yep. If that's all you can do, that's starting. Yeah, I mean, you really look at it from there, one chapter a day. And if a book's only 12 or 13 chapters, you can finish two books in a month. Yeah. That's 24 books in a year, (laughs) which is, which is pretty crazy. But yeah, I mean, those are some of my, those are some of my favorites, um, that I talk about all the time. And then there's another book by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, that's a great book. Not, not just about saving money in general, but also learning how to invest and being mindful about who you take your advice from, Mm -hmm. and not just from a financial perspective, but also just in life. Yeah. So I just want to thank you for joining me today and oh, kind it's my of pleasure. touching the tip of the iceberg and as yeah, far and as finances. Yeah, and there's a, it, it can go a lot deeper than that. But mm-hmm. one thing I wanted to tell you, like we, we've had a few phone conversations. I'm proud of you for doing this because this is a big step yeah. for you. You know <laughs> what is. I mean? And I, I'm proud of what you're doing. Uh, and I want to see you keep continuing on because that, having starting something like this is inspirational to other people because they don't know what is possible until they actually try yes and that's why i'm here i took a jump yeah exactly (laughs) but i i appreciate uh you uh, coming and kind of touching base on all this and like i said his book was pretty easy to read and it sounded like you're you know well you are my friend but like a friend was just yeah in my ear like telling me so i highly recommend you reading his book Um, And again, guys, just start small. If you're just starting on your financial journey, start small. Don't overwhelm yourself. Baby steps. It takes time and you need patience. It's it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Exactly. Right. So anything else you would like to say? Um, You know, just the one thing is just make. Make taking your finances a priority. Yeah. You know, and the one thing I'll, I'll leave with with this is more people spend more time planning their next vacation that only lasts one to two weeks versus retirement which lasts 20 30 years so really Mm. let that sink in yeah because it's pretty important yeah very important yeah yeah but hey once again thanks for having me you know it's a real honor to be a part of your journey and i'm really excited to see what you're going to do here in the future oh thank you and i you know appreciate you coming and then if any of you guys have any questions for him um we'll link his uh contact information yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah it's not, it, uh, you know i'm looking forward to helping as many people as i can that's part of the reason why i got into the industry yes because so many people are very financially illiterate and it's my job to make people very financially literate. Yes, that's important. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, th- you know, no, it's my honor. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you. All right, guys. Talk to you later. That was episode three of the Purposely Curious podcast. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And follow us on social media at Purposely Curious on Instagram and Purposely C Pod on Twitter. That's Purposely, the letter C, Pod. Until next time, you know what to do.